the rise of the Turks and the fall of the Byzantine Empire, and explain everything presentation by Kevin F. Kaiser. Woohoo! By 732 AD, the Umayyad Caliphate, the first caliphate after the four caliphs immediately subsequent to Muhammad, this caliphate was the fifth largest empire in world history. It's stretching from the borders of India all the way to Spain and North Africa. It was unified by official religion, Islam, and by language, Arabic, a Semitic language. But it was also marked by strife. Non-Arabs, especially the intelligent Persian Sassanids, were disgruntled because they were treated as second-class citizens. Um, they would be from this area right here, the area of Persia, the Sassanids, the ones that uh, made their own empire during the third century as, uh, and was the main enemy of Rome. They were very well educated, very intelligent, keeping that Persian tradition. But in the new uh, Umayyad Caliphate, which is mainly dominated by Arabs, um, they were just treated as second-class citizens, even though they were Muslim. Then there were Shiites, and these, this caliphate is thoroughly Sunni, um, and Shiites are also treated as second-class citizens. Indeed, worse, they're treated as heretics, and therefore they're angry because the infidel Sunnis are in power. In 750 AD, the Abbasid Caliphate uh, came to, decided to do something about this. Uh, the uh, Abbasids made use of both Persian and Shiite discontent. They actually said they were going to proclaim a Shiite Caliphate, and then they used also Persian discontent to replace the Umayyad Caliphate. Um, they uh, uh, made a brand new Caliphate, starting from Damascus and eventually spreading... I uh, can't use that color, just give me a second here. Um, I'm just gonna, okay. Technical difficulties, it's going to take a while. This is not the easiest program in the world. There we go. Starting in Damascus, they eventually conquered a good portion of the Caliphate. They got control of Arabia. They got control of... Uh, the especially Mesopotamia and Persia, and their influence even extended um, into Egypt and North Africa, pretty much all the way up to except uh, immediately south of Spain and Spain itself. Um, this was known as the Abbasid Caliphate. And they also wanted a fresh new start, so they did not want to use the capital of Damascus like the Umayyad Caliphate used. So they made a new uh, capital, uh, modern-day Baghdad. In 762, they built the city of Baghdad um, in Mesopotamia. Now, there was one problem. Uh, they started out as Shiite, but as soon as they came to power, they also converted back to Sunni Islam. So once again, the Shiites are not particularly happy. Therefore... Um, in the year 973, the Shiites made their own caliphate, the radical Fatimid caliphate that uh, has its center in Egypt. And they also wanted to make a fresh new start, so they built their own brand new city. They didn't want to use Alexandria. That was too Christian for them. So they built their own capital city of Cairo. Now, so you have the Fatimid Shiite Caliphate in Egypt, the only Shiite Caliphate in history, um, and you have the Abbasid Caliphate, and these two began fighting for control mainly of the Levant. Um, as you know, as we talked about in the Hellenistic era, the control of the Levant in Syria is um, always a bone of contention. We saw that with the Seleucids and the Ptolemies back in the Hellenistic era. Same thing here, the um, Abbasids and the Fatimids are constantly fighting back and forth for this territory. And in doing so, they both avoid direct fighting. Uh, that's just too precious. They both make use of um, people uh, that are not themselves to help fight each other. So, for instance, the Fatimids use... Uh, Twelver Shiites called the Buyids who live in Syria to fight back at the Abbasids. But then the Abbasids get the upper hand. They make use of a new people that have migrated from a modern day area of Kazakhstan. Uh, they came in around this time, a new people called the Turks, our next horse people. I've told you several times that there's always horse people coming out of the dirt from the east, and that's basically what we have here again, or not really the dirt, the grasslands, the steppes. Um, and here's our new horse people, the Turks. 
These Turks were soon converted. They start, began to infiltrate, and they were used by the uh, Abbasids, um, not really as mercenaries, but as foreign fighters. They were used as foreign fighters to fight against the Fatimids. Um, they were soon converted to Sunni Islam, and they became very zealous. In fact, more zealous than the Abbasids themselves, who they considered a bit decadent and inefficient. One thing you should know about the Abbasids is they are very much a people of high culture. Baghdad had a place called the House of Wisdom, where they began uh, translating Greek works into Arabic, and basically they esteemed the finer things in life, culture, um, art, etc. That's not for the Turks. The Turks uh, are for religion, 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 and they see the Abbasids as kind of getting lazy. So they slowly begin to take over, um, so much so that in 1055 AD, they took control of Baghdad itself, and they began really ruling the Caliphate, using the Caliph himself as a, as a puppet ruler. Now, since they're Sunni Muslims, they believe that the uh, Caliph has to be chosen by the Muslim community, uh, originally the fighting companions of the Prophet, but now whoever arises from the Ummah, uh, the Ummah, the Muslim community. So they're not going to dare call themselves Caliphs because they were not chosen. Um, so instead, they give themselves the title Sultan, which roughly means holder of power. Recall, Caliph means the successor to the Prophet, but these Turks are now Sultans, which means they hold the power, but the Caliph still remains the Caliph. The Seljuks began conquering with energy. In 1070, um, they spread their influence even to Jerusalem. Um, now, there they slaughtered Christian and Jewish people living there, Christian pilgrims visiting or Christians living there, and Jews as well, um, which is something that the Abbasids did not do, nor even the Umayyads. There was relative tolerance in, uh, relative tolerance in Jerusalem before the Turks, but in, the Turks themselves caused a lot of trouble. Um, then, the Byzantine Empire, which, if you recall, sees itself as one of the protectors of Christendom. They're kind of in competition with the Holy Roman Empire over that capacity, who gets to protect Christendom. The Byzantine Empire prepares a large army to come down and uh, try to beat out away these Turks. So it's basically the largest, the last great military effort of the Byzantine Empire, and unfortunately, it fails. The Battle of Manzikert in 1071, the Turks utterly destroy the Byzantine army and even kill the Byzantine emperor himself. Um, so the Byzantine Empire has no choice but to beg for help from the West, and they do not turn to the Holy Roman Emperor. They turn to the one who everybody knows at this time, this is the 11th century, really rules the West, and that is the Pope. So the, the new Byzantine Emperor calls for help from the Pope and asks the Pope to summon the Christian kingdoms of the West to help the Byzantine Empire, which is being surrounded by the Turks. Ironically, by the time this uh, request reaches Rome, the Fatimids have already taken back Jerusalem, so the original whole purpose uh, you know, of you know, delivering uh, Jerusalem from the Turks is already a moot point because the Fatimids have regained control of Jerusalem by that point. At first, the Pope says, uh, does a delay tactic. The first Pope to receive this request is Pope Gregory VII, and he's got much busier things to do, like reforming the church. Um, and also, it was bad timing. Unfortunately, Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity were not on good terms. In 1054 AD, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which uh, mainly belongs to the Byzantine Empire and also the Kievan Rus, had broken from the Catholic Church, ultimately because the Pope added the word filioque to the Nicene Creed. Um, the reason for this is, uh, well, first of all, it's a theological reason. This is the creed we say every Sunday. It comes at the part where uh, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Pope added the word and the Son because it's theologically correct. If the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone, he is the Son. Um, so this was just had to be added. But it's also changing an ancient creed, a creed that goes all the way back to Constantine himself in 325 A.D., the Eastern Orthodox Church basically says, you can't change the ancient tradition. And the Pope says, oh, yes, I can. And this causes ultimately a split. There's a lot of other reasons, too, but this is the ultimate straw that breaks the camel's back. And we have the Great Schism, the Great Split. Um, Christendom uh, between East and West is no longer united. Um, Thus, when the Byzantines asked for help, it did not come immediately. But finally, in 1095 AD, Pope Urban II appealed to all the kingdoms of Europe to come to the aid of the Byzantine Empire and to free Jerusalem. This took place at the Council of Claremont in France. The Pope literally said, save our, our brothers in the east, save Jerusalem, but also stop fighting amongst yourselves and go use your pent-up energy on uh, smashing infidels. This started the Crusades, Christian holy wars against non-Christians. 
Between 1095 and 1291, there were nine crusades. For the most part, they ended in failure as regards their main goal. Um, but they did have four effects. There is one thing that you should know. The first one did end in basic success. They got Jerusalem, and they established four little um, European Latin Christian kingdom or not kingdoms, um, uh, basically principates on the Levant coast. So just imagine the situation of these four Christian uh, you know, uh, principates um, surrounded by Muslims, who at this point are fighting each other most of the time. So they're actually pretty safe for the first uh, couple, for the, about the first century of being here. Um, but it's a tough job. There's all these, these four principates that are basically out there alone. Well, for the most part alone. We'll be talking about that in a second. Oops, uh, just give me a second. Oh, no. Okay. Let me see if I can get this back to, there we go, zoom back out. Um, now, the Crusades basically end in failure, but they do have four things that are very important for our purposes. The first thing that they did is, well, those four kingdoms have to be supplied. So they begin to, uh, it gives chance for uh, maritime, uh, maritime principalities such as uh, Venice, Genoa, Pisa, and Florence to extend uh, trade to the east. They have to supply these kingdoms, so they become, uh, they come to the fore, and uh, also Constantinople. Constantinople is kind of the hub that the Crusaders always stop at on their way to, uh, you know, to go fight the infidel. So these maritime powers, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Pisa, etc., are um, extending trade to the east. And eventually, um, trading with the Christian kingdoms, they also have contact with the uh, the Turks that are willing to trade with them, and they get some of the goods of the Far East, even um, Persia, etc., even India to some extent. This is going to get Europeans hooked on the luxuries and wealth of the East, especially spices, and that will make them want to continue trade contact with uh, the other with the Eastern regions. So the Crusades is kind of what gets this started. There hasn't been a lot of trade since the fall of the Roman Empire, with the exception of the Vikings. The Vikings also taught to trade, but here's a big boost to trade is these Crusades. A second effect of the Crusades was the spread of the Crusader mentality to other parts of Europe. Um, in the original idea of the Crusades, the Pope offered spiritual benefits such as a plenary indulgence for taking up the cross, that's where we get the word crusaders, the cruce signati, for taking up the cross and going all the way across the seas to fight the infidel. Even the journey itself was part of the spiritual sacrifice. Um, and so the four kingdoms that uh, were established on the Levant coast were known as Outremer, across the sea, going overseas. People talked about going to Outremer. But eventually it became evident that it wasn't necessary to spread Christendom and fight the infidel to go all the way to Outremer. We could just fight the infidel right here at home in Europe. And this had many effects. Um, some were very bad. For instance, in Germany, uh, again, Germany is a region at this time, not a country. So in the German-speaking lands, there were pogroms, these uh, groups, these mobs of uh, G German Christians who looked for Jews and uh, basically sl slew them um, as, as infidels. There was also the Baltic Crusade up in the, um, the uh, Baltic coast in northeastern Europe. There was this movement to convert by force or to uh, slaughter the uh, Lithuanian or Old Prussian pagans, in other words, to bring them into the uh, fold of Christendom. There was also the Albigensian Crusade against the heretics of southern France, um, and that's something we can talk about some other time. But then, for our purposes right now, another big one was the Reconquista, um, a, a new spur to the movement of the Reconquista, the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula by Christian kingdoms. This movement has already been underway since actually shortly after the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem. Um, however, during the Crusades, it got a huge advance forward. Um, El Cid took Valencia in 1084. Um, Toledo was taken in, um, uh, in 1085. Uh, so you get the idea that uh, there's this movement to try to take back the, the Iberian Peninsula for Christian kingdoms. And eventually, as you see here, there were several Christian kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula. We see here Portugal, Leon, Castile, Navarre, and Aragon. But even Aragon by this point has already swallowed up another one that was there, Catalonia. And eventually these have become quite influential. Um, Right now, they're rather piecemeal, but eventually they'll emerge. Leon and Castile will eventually emerge um, when their monarchs get married, and you have the kingdom of Leon and Castile. Um, Aragon will eventually get bigger. Aragon, using Catalonian ingenuity, eventually uh, he makes a huge maritime empire that ends up taking the Balearic Islands, um, Corsica, Sardinia, 
um, Sicily and southern Italy. They get that after the whole fiasco with Frederick II, Hohenstaufen, and a few other fiascos. Um, so they end up having this large maritime empire that's going to be also extremely successful. And this is, of course, important because the two monarchs that send Columbus, Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, will be also hugely influential. Their marriage to each other will basically unite Spain. Um, so the Reconquista movement is also in effect. A third effect is that relations actually became worse between Western Europe and the Byzantine Empire. The Pope probably hoped that the schism would heal due to the Western help, but the exact opposite ha happened, especially because in the Fourth Crusade, the Crusaders decided to sack Constantinople in 1204 as an easy way to get cash. Basically, the Crusaders owed a lot of money to Venice because Venice built them all these ships, but then only a third of the uh, people who were going to use the ships showed up, but Venice was not going to um, remit their debt. And so they decided to reroute to Constantinople and sack Constantinople instead of going to Jerusalem. And this is not going to uh, help relationships between the East and the West. Why is this important for us? Because later, this hatred that forms between the Byzantine Empire and the West is going to get so strong that later when the Byzantine Empire still begs for help, um, the West is going to say, too much water under the bridge. Um, you guys hate us because of 1204. Um, we're just going to hate you back and we're not going to help you anymore. A fourth effect was the weakening of both the Seljuk Turks and the Christian kingdoms on the Levant coast, Outremer, to the point that they made themselves both weak and were not prepared for another threat that neither one was prepared for, that neither one was uh, saw coming. The Mongol hordes, the storm from the east, um, starting um, in the middle of the um, 13th century, um, the Mongols suddenly showed up on their great hordes of horsemen and began to take Persia. Um, nobody could stop them. They used uh, terror and other such things to get uh, to lo lower morale. They were fast on horses. They had siege weapons. Um, they quickly spread, and there's, um, they created the, lar the world's largest contiguous empire. They eventually dominated the Kievan Rus and put them into subjection. They even attacked um, Poland, the borders of Poland, and the borders of Hungary. They actually decimated the population of Hungary, and the only thing that got Hungary saved was uh, the death of the Khan, the Khan back in Khan Balik. Um, all the guys, uh, the generals had to go back for the election of a new Khan, which is what normally happened. But for our purposes, the main thing is the end of the Seljuk Turks. In 1058, these Mongols got Baghdad. Um, and that, uh, and they just, uh, that was the end of the Seljuk Turks. But the Christian kingdoms also uh, were indirectly affected insofar as um, right around the same time as the Mongols are attacking from the east, there is dis uh, disruption of life in Egypt because the current Ayyubid Sultanate, which had replaced the Fatimids, the Ayyubid Sultanate is the one that was left by Saladin. If you've heard of Saladin, um, you'll be reading Dante this year, so you know, Sal you'll see Saladin in... Uh, in the uh, top level of, um, of hell, um, but uh, in the righteous pagans. Um, Saladin was a sultan who had taken over Egypt and Syria for the first time that those two places were united since the Umayyad Caliphate. And um, he had created the Ayyubid Sultanate, but they had some discomfort, di uh, a lot of re di um, unrest due to the Mamluks. The Mamluks uh, were slave slave mercenaries of the uh, Ayyubid sultans, but eventually they also took over and created their own sultanate, the Mamluk Sultanate. Um, this Mamluk Sultanate, um, first let me label these real quick. Change the color. This Mamluk Sultanate um, was the one that decided it had to confront the uh, Mongol hordes. And they did successfully. They're the only people that were really able to stop the Mongol advance. Uh, they successfully com uh, defeated the Mongols and, and halted their advance at the Battle of Ayin Jalut. But in the process, they also eliminated the Christian kingdoms. The Mamluk uh, uh, sultans wiped out the last Christian stronghold at Acre, and uh, the Christians were then... Um, kicked out of the Holy Land, and that was basically the end of the whole crusading period. Um, so the Mongols brought it to an end. Well, who are these Mongols? Now, um, why were these Mongols so successful? Well, they're a Far Eastern people who've been united by a genius named Temujin in the late 12th and early 13th century. He was known as Genghis Khan, or the Universal Ruler. Genghis Khan and his sons after him quickly expanded the Mongol Empire to become the largest contiguous empire in the world. They did this by using lightning, uh, just give me a second, lightning fast cavalry, cavalry 
Um, you can see it down here as well. Um, they did this, uh, they, they traveled light, you know, here's a yurt, they build themselves some yurts. Um, also siege weaponry and light armor. Uh, their main trick was they used silk because that way if they were shot by an arrow, they could just stretch the silk and the arrow would fall out and they took care of the main problem with arrows, uh, pulling the arrow out afterwards. Um, and also terror. Um, they would take uh, barely any prisoners or they would promise to take prisoners and kill them all and then let a few go and tell those few to go to the next town and tell them they were coming. And they just base, it's similar to what we've seen with the Assyrians. Um, we similar to Tamerlan's empire later, just terror, just, uh, they, you know, people give up. They have no morale by the time the Mongols come. It worked. Their empire stretched from Hungary and Poland all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Again, the largest. Now, even though they're bad when they're attacking you, once they take over, they're actually uh, pretty good. That is, they settle down. They're religiously tolerant. As a matter of fact, at one point, they were willing. some of them were willing to become Christian and help the Christians get rid of the Mamluks, but that never took place. But the point is, they don't care if you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, um, Hindu, whatever. They let you believe your, what, your own religion. And they also allowed trade. And they also kind of lost, they got pretty weak after a while. It's not a particularly long-lasting uh, united empire. Um, they, eventually, they eventually divided into four khanates, um, and in 1299, the Turks started to rise up again, led by a man named Osman. They decided to reboot. It's the reboot of the Turks, so to speak. And this time it's under a guy named Osman. He begins in northwest Anatolia. And because his name is Osman, we call them the Ottoman Turks. And they start to take over slowly Anatolia, um, throwing off the claim of the Mongols or whoever else happens to be in uh, Turkey. The Ottomans begin, oh, sorry, we got to put them back on here. The Ottomans begin by taking Byzantine territory from Asia Minor. Um, then they do not make the mistake of the Umayyad Caliphate. They do not attack Constantinople directly. They cross the Hellespont and start to take Greece. They start to take Bulgaria. They start to take parts of Romania. And by the way, this is when they're fought, uh, they're fought against over here very hard by a man named Vlad the Third Tepes, Vlad Dracula. This is the Dracula that you've all heard of. Um, they're one of the main, he's one of the main guys that tries to stop them. He just loves killing Turks, but uh, that's why he gets his reputation for being bloody. Um, they take parts of Hungary, and their whole goal is to surround Constantinople. And poor Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire is now one city. Constantinople is still called the Byzantine Empire, but by this point it's just one single city. They were unstoppable mainly because of their elite troops called the Yeni Seri, or New Force, known to the West as Janissaries. These were Christians kidnapped as boys and then forcibly converted into Islam and trained as the best soldiers in Europe. The Byzantine Empire was being crushed, but the Western Kingdom sent no one. They appealed to help, and no one came. Hungary tried to help them at first, but, uh, and the Pope called for crusades, but nobody came. Hungary failed. Um, and even Petrarch, the Petrarch that we talked about in the Renaissance, um, he, uh, he told the Pope, don't send anybody. Let the Turks win. Um, let the, the Byzantines hate us. The Turks don't. Um, let's, just let, uh, let's just let the Turks take Byzantium. It's better to have the Turks as our neighbor rather than the Byzantine Empire. So you see the hatred that's grown between them. No one comes to help the East. Um, there's just too much water under the bridge. Mehmed II, Sultan Mehmed II, in 1453, um, using huge cannons that were sold to him by Hungarians, um, blew a hole in the wall of Constantinople. You can see the cannons right here. You can see uh, um, this is a contemporary image over here. Uh, sorry, I accidentally drew on that uh, right here. Um, here you can see them transporting the cannon. There's Mehmed himself up in the corner. Um, and then uh, you can also see him triumphantly marching in. Um, the city only had 7,000 defenders in it, much smaller than Mehmed's army. Um, they took over the city, and eventually it became known as Istanbul. Istanbul in Turkish just means in the city, so they wanted to wipe out the name of Constantine from it. Um, the name isn't official until much, much later, but the point is, this is when we normally say that now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Um, Trade was now closed off to the east. As long as Constantinople was there, Venice and Genoa had a chance to go across the Black Sea and get to trade to the east uh, with the Mongols. But now that trade is closed. There's no way to the Black Sea. There's no way to get to the east except by paying huge tariffs. And so now it's time to find another way. And this is going to be the time of Portugal and Spain. Thank you very much.